Welcome to the Tough Decisions Network. This is our special Sunday edition called Survive and Thrive with Danae. Your host, Danae Hanford, will dive deep into chapter-by-chapter discussions on specifically selected books to help you make better decisions as an entrepreneur. Visit toughdecisions.net to sign up for our free weekly entrepreneur email. Before we get started, let's hear from one of our sponsors. Have you ever thought about investing in real estate, but find yourself so busy that you don't have time for it? Do you have FOMO, which is the fear of missing out? At HanfordCapital.com, we help investors with passive real estate investments that project better returns than traditional investment vehicles such as the stock market. If you'd like to find out more about our passive real estate investments, visit HanfordCapital.com. That's H-A-N-D-F-O-R-D Capital.com. We will jump on a call with you to discuss your investment goals and to see if our investments are a good fit for you. This advertisement is not to be construed as an offer or recommendation to buy or sell a security. Visit HanfordCapital.com. Hello, thank you for joining me this Sunday, December 16th, for our second Sunday in discussing some of the secrets of the world's best speakers. We are currently discussing topics from a book called Talk Like Ted, The Nine Public Speaking Secrets of the World's Top Minds. And I think this is such an important topic for all of us. And I mentioned this in the first and probably the second Sunday as well. But just to mention again, you know, if we're going to have influence on people around us, we really have to be able to communicate our ideas in an effective way. And I'm not talking about manipulating people and having them do things that are not for their own good or doing things against their will. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm just talking about the skillful presentation of ideas in a way that makes people think and consider their value and eventually prompts them to action. And as business owners, as leaders, as heads of our families, this is such an important thing that we be able to do. And so I have really enjoyed getting into this book and looking at the first public speaking secret of the world's top minds. It was speak with passion. And passion is not really something that you can fake. And so that leads us to the idea of, you know, learning to speak and find the ideas that you can speak about within the areas that you're passionate about. And no matter what it is, if we're passionate about it, we can usually relate it to people. We can communicate it in a way that's interesting because people find conversation with other people interesting. And we're social creatures. So when they sense a passion, when they sense an excitement and enthusiasm about a topic, it really can't help but be contagious. So speaking with passion is the number one secret. And I hesitate to call any of them the most important, but I think it really is a foundational secret as far as speaking goes. Now, the second public speaking secret is master the art of storytelling. We have to be able to effectively tell a story. And we'll talk a little bit about the reasons for that. But the chapter opens with a quote from Brene Brown. And the quote is, stories are just data with a soul. I really think that captures the idea. You know, people are generally not interested in a bunch of statistics. The only people who are interested in statistics are the people that are already interested in the topic and understand what those statistics mean for them to start with. And that's not really who we need to prepare our speaking for. We need to prepare our speaking for the people who have no clue what those statistics mean. They need to know how your ideas relate to them and what they should do and what action they should take after you finish. And so I think that quote, stories are just data with a soul, is important because it captures the primary idea here. And that is when we tell stories, we give our audience something to connect to. You know, again, we don't connect to numbers and facts. We connect to people. And that's what a story does is give them someone to connect to. And we'll talk more about that as we go as well. Now, Carmine Gallo starts the chapter with a story. It's a story about an attorney who gave a TED Talk, and I'll not go into a lot of detail there. But what we do take away from that is that this particular attorney named Brian Stevenson spent almost 70% of his 18-minute TED Talk in this area of pathos. 
Now, I want to stop and make sure that we're on the same page with that term, pathos. And in order to understand it, you have to go back to a Greek philosopher called Aristotle. He was one of the founding fathers of communication theory. In fact, I remember studying Aristotle's communication theory in one of my writing classes in college because we were learning persuasion and we were learning, we were actually learning creative writing, but even in creative writing, you know, we don't we don't always think of creative writing as being persuasive, but it is. And so we were studying Aristotle's communication theory, and he basically believed that persuasion can take place when there are three components present. One is ethos, one is logos, and one is pathos. And I'm sure you've heard of those root words before, but ethos basically refers to the credibility of the speaker. And so There has to be some level of authority in the speaker, but I think a lot of times we get stuck here. You know, we want to speak and we want to tell everybody about our qualifications or we want everybody to know about who we are. And really, as long as there's some level of authority or credibility, you will be okay there. And in the rest of the way that you deliver your speech, this ethos can be built up. So we don't have to spend huge amounts of time in this area of credibility or ethos, but that's what happens sometimes. It is necessary, but it's not, it shouldn't be, I don't think, primary. The second component is logos, and this is a means of persuasion through exactly what it sounds like, logic, data, statistics, all those are in the area of logos. And then finally there's pathos, and perhaps that reminds you of the primary word that we studied or talked about last week, which is passion, and if it does, That's good because pathos is the act of appealing to an individual's emotions. All three are necessary in order for persuasion to take place. If we're going to be truly persuasive, we do have to have credibility. If we're going to be truly persuasive, our ideas do have to have logic and data and statistics to back them. But they also have to have pathos. And I don't think necessarily that any one of these is more important than the other, but I do think that pathos is something that takes more time than logos and ethos. Pathos and appealing to a group's emotions requires more work, more effort, more time than just presenting data and, you know, presenting your own credibility. So with that said, let's go back to the TED Talk speaker, Brian Stevenson. Almost 70% of his 18-minute TED Talk was spent in this area of pathos. 70%. I'm trying to do the math here in my head on the fly, but based on what I'm figuring here, that's just a little over five minutes, maybe five and a half minutes of his 18 minutes was spent in ethos and logos. So what does that leave us? 12 to 13 minutes that he spent appealing to the emotions. Again, I think we have to be careful because we don't want to manipulate people. And some speakers can use emotion to manipulate people into doing things that are against their best interest or or things that they don't, shouldn't do. But I think using pathos in an ethical way is, can be a very powerful tool. And it definitely should be something that we don't shy away from. Now, you'll also remember that last Sunday I referred to, actually, this may have been the first Sunday, I referred to someone that we've all heard of before, Dale Carnegie. And he also, in his communication, his book on communication, he recommended using stories. And he talked about the power of stories to inspire people. And one of the quotes from his book says that great truths, the great truths of the world, have often been couched in fascinating stories. You know, when I read that, my mind immediately jumped to the Aesop's fables or the Aesop's fables. And these are old stories told by, you know, oral storytellers. And now we, you know, we've written them down. In fact, my daughter, I think in school last year, they had a book that they read that was almost entirely Aesop's fables. And what was the point of those fables? Well, they were a teaching tool. Because children are the perfect example of learning via a story. You know, if you can teach them a principle and give them a story to connect to that principle, you are about a thousand times more likely to get your point across than if you just tell it to them. And that's what an Aesop fable does. It tells a story 
that illustrates a truth. And that's what Carnegie said. The great truths of the world have often been couched in fascinating stories. And so if that's true, which I believe it is, then why would we not use stories when we are speaking? Because if we really want to communicate, we're going to definitely use a story. And if we don't really want to communicate, then why are we speaking to start with? That is the whole point, is to communicate. You know, if you've ever talked to a child or taught maybe a younger class in school, you know the power of a story. And you know, I even get a little frustrated sometimes because there's a handful of stories that I've told my children. Actually, you know, I tell them stories all the time, but a handful of them, they want me to retell it feels like on a daily basis, and it's like, oh my goodness, are you serious? I don't think I can tell this story again. And it's a little hard to tell the story with as much passion the 550th time you tell it as it is the first time. But I try because I know that that's what they're listening for. They're listening for that excitement or that fear or that competition or that angst that I was feeling in that moment. That's what they're looking to feel. In those moments when they feel whatever I was feeling in the story that I'm relating to them, then that's also when I have the opportunity for me to teach and for them to learn whatever it is that I'm trying to communicate. So that's how stories help us. Now, as I mentioned before, we have now the benefits of the functional MRI, and we can actually see that this is the case. And Yuri Hassan was an assistant professor of psychology at Princeton when he decided to set up an activity to find out exactly what is going on in the brain when it's listening to a story. So Mr. Hassan, he set up this functional MRI and he recorded the brain activity of an individual telling unrehearsed stories. Then he had a group of people who had never met this individual and didn't know who it was listen to those stories on a recording and he recorded their brain activity. And what they found was remarkable in that basically the listener's brain activity mirrored the speaker's brain activity. Literally, that story allowed the speaker to connect to the brain of the listener. All right, in science speak, they exhibited joint temporally coupled response patterns. Their brains were responding the same way. Put simply in language that you and I can relate to, the listener's brain responses mirrored the speaker's brain responses. And then Carmine Gallo adds, there was actually a mind meld between the speaker and the listener. Stories are powerful. And if they are that powerful, which science and personal experience tells us that they are, why would we not use stories? We have to use more stories in order to communicate effectively. Interestingly enough, this coupling that was referred to did not occur when the listeners were told in a story in a language that they couldn't understand. So it wasn't just the words that were being spoken or the actual story. It was when it was something they could relate to. It had to be something that they understood and they could experience along with the speaker. Now, Gallo closes the chapter by telling us about three different types of stories that we can use. And this is very simple. It's almost overly simple, but I do want to mention it. You know, the first story, and, and what I think is perhaps the most powerful type of story, is a personal story. You know, again, having told stories to my kids and, and my own children and having taught middle school mainly for six years I know that personal stories get their attention faster than anything. They want to know about who you are. And the same thing is true when you're speaking in a crowd of educated entrepreneurs or educated business people or educated employees. They want to know about the person that is speaking to them. So personal stories can be very, very powerful. There are also stories about other people that we can share. And I'm a big, big history person. I love to read. I love to read historical fiction. And I think the power of historical fiction, it's always a good story about another person. And so stories about other people, whether history, ancient history, modern history, or even current events, 
can also be very powerful. And maybe we should spend a little bit more time reading and finding out about these people and their stories so that we can share them with other people. I think that could be a very effective addition to our speaking. Lastly, there are stories about brand success. And, you know, Gallo has worked with lots and lots of business CEOs. And so he said he always finds that sharing stories about brands and companies that have been successful is always a good way of getting people's attention, particularly when you're speaking in the area of business or technology or or financial fields. You know, it's no coincidence that companies have started to realize the power of stories and the power of people. And I challenge you to just think about some of the commercials. If you watch TV, we watch a little bit of TV, but we don't usually watch commercials. So I haven't even seen some of these that are mentioned here. But Gallo mentioned several very well-known companies like Taco Bell, Domino's Pizza, Kashi, that's actually one I've seen, McDonald's, Starbucks, turning to the power of storytelling to market themselves and brand themselves, you know, highlighting the people that create their products and the farmers that grow the materials for their products. Because people connect to people. They don't connect to numbers. They don't connect to facts. People connect to people. And so we have to be able to relate our speaking, relate our ideas to ourselves personally and to our audience personally. Finally, just one note here as far as the types of stories that are most powerful. You know, Gallo calls them a hero story. Um, He refers to the American writer Kurt Vonnegut, who did a lot of work in the, the storytelling theory and the different storytelling diagrams, you know, what makes an interesting story. Most importantly, it is give me someone that I can cheer for. Give me somebody that I can root for. Give me a hero. And so no matter what story you're telling, you can frame it so that there is a hero. And the way that you tell it, there can be a villain. And it may be a personal villain. It may be an impersonal villain. But there can be a bad guy, if you will. I have a a boy, a six-year-old, and nothing rouses his chivalry and his energy faster than having a bad guy to root against and having a bad guy to beat up for me or for one of his sisters. And so we're all in a sense very similar to that is we want somebody to root for. We want somebody to cheer for and we want a bad guy to root against. And so no matter what story you're telling, think about how you can frame it and how you can use it so that there is a hero. And the, sometimes just the simple way that we tell the story helps to create that hero and helps to depict the villain in a way that, that makes the story even more powerful and more convincing. You know, don't expect your audience to take your logos, your data, your statistics, and figure out how it relates to them. Use a story. Use a personal story. You know, someone else's story. Use a hero and a villain to help them make those connections, and you will be much more successful, much more persuasive, and a much better communicator in the end. Thank you for listening to the Tough Decisions Network. Be sure to visit toughdecisions.net to gain access to show notes for this episode and to join our free weekly entrepreneur email where we will send you news about the latest technology for your business, inspiring quotes, and the latest books for entrepreneurs. That's toughdecisions.net.